temples. Right here, Gandara, at the temple of Hedheru. Let's go inside these temples, brothers and sisters, and going inside these temples, here we can see an ancient spiritual story where a star, here we see he's born in a manger. But one of the things that I make sure of is that we get accounts that's not going to be revealed to tour groups who come through here. That's what I try to do. Reveal the information that would normally would be passed by and not even mentioned to many of the Europeans because it would conflict with their European Western world through their own European. This is a tour book. It's good to pick these little books up. And it's written by the Mormons. The Mormons who write these books. The Mormons. Okay. But the Mormons are heavily into Kemet. Now, this is a chapel. This is where, this chapel is where Haru was born in a manger at December the 25th. Okay. Now, here's the book. Let me read it. You have the book? That's page 18. Here's the chapel, right where you are. Is that the same chapel? Yes. Okay, you see where I have yellow in there, right? Okay, so let me read it. This court and chapel, from a special unit within the great temple, they were used for the celebration of the day of the child in his cradle a festival commemorating the birth of Horus, which coming as it did at the close of the Egyptian year offers a curious resemblance to the Christian festival of Christmas. How could it be a curious resemblance <laughs> when this predates yeah. European Christianity? Right. What was the symbol of this temple right here? What zoomorphic form? Cow. The cow. cow. Now, have you often wonder why the cow is always in the manger. Yeah. This is Hathor right here with the cow's ears that looked over Haru in his birth at December the 25th. Here you see at a pictorial version of their painting of the European Jesus wrapped up like the mummy that was called the Carissing that we'll get into in the lecture series, showing you right here why is it a cow? No one had never asked why is the cow in the manger? Because the cow was head of Haru. And when Haru was born in the manger, this was his surrogate mother, the cow. That the cow symbolically plays the surrogate mother on the, over the European pictorial versions of the Bible that we have right here. So again, you can see where it all came from. I know this is hard for some folks, but you have come back to see it. Not one group by the thousands who come here is getting this like you're getting it. Now you see the cow head a root over the king horse that you see right here. That every king that was born. Like horse born in this chapel right here. Put this in your own mental court of law. Let's see all the evidence. And once all the evidence is presented, we can see where European Western version of Christianity copied from this. And judge it for yourself. You've heard their side of the story? Take time out and hear your ancestors' side of the story. We're saying Our African ancestors, brothers and sisters, saw the matrilineal system. Keep in mind that all the kings had to come through the line of the woman. Is that right? That's right. What man can say he didn't come from a woman? Please step forward so we can understand where you came from. So our ancestors had no problems understanding that divine principle of that sacred womb where we all came from. That was the basis and foundation of the goddess principle and the matrilineal system in Africa. And our ancestors saw in order for the king to rule the throne, like you have Ursa Maat right here, the goddess Shashat. Here you see her in the tree of divine wisdom, giving the fruit of divine knowledge and wisdom in order for him to rule the throne. It had nothing to do with no tree of good and evil. The patriarchs who came from the north, the Hicksoaks, and others who had a misogynistic nature, a hatred towards the woman, could not conceive of a woman nor a goddess giving a man anything. And that story was corrupted. The tree of divine wisdom and divine life was corrupted into the tree of what? Because here we have that they created and their biblical stories and the opening of the pages in Genesis that 
they, there was Adam and Eve, is that right? And they were not to eat of the tree of what? Knowledge, Knowledge of what? Good and, evil. Good and evil. Now who was seduced by the serpent and ate from the tree? Eve. That's why, sisters, you got to watch and you hear that sound. Psst. <laughs> but anyway, here we see that she was seduced to eat the fruit, and then she seduced who? Adam. Adam. Now, we are told that that's the reason for the world's sins of this first woman eating of the tree of good and evil, and that that's also not only the reason for the world's sins, but her monthly cycle is to remind her of that sin. This is what's taught in the church. The African story is the goddess Shashat giving the fruit of divine life from the tree of divine life and wisdom in order for the king to rule the throne. Okay. On this relief, brothers and sisters, you can see many concepts where they came in, as I said, like scavengers, and picked different pieces. On this particular relief, you can see where the Western world through Judaism took a piece of a concept of the creation story from. You can see where the Greek philosophers took a concept of Greek philosophy from. And you can also see where Christianity took a concept, European Christianity took a concept from. So let's break it down. Again, carved in stone on the temple of Aset, right here on the island of Philae. It is here. It tells where the Western world literally came like scavengers and took various scenes to make up the Western world. And one of those scenes is we see that Hermes Trismegistus and Greece, Greek mythology they literally took it from Tahuti. It is here that our ancestors had a study from the 42 books of Tahuti, representing science, law, and intelligence, who was represented as the Ibis bird that you saw. We saw those little white birds that we saw come yeah. over here. So our ancestors looked at nature. We didn't worship the bird, yeah. but it was an attribute of science, yeah. attribute of intelligence. Tahuti writing down the deeds of our life on earth as we lived here. This is where the Western philosophical thought Greeks took their concept of Hermes Trismegistus from Tahuti, now called Thought too. So we see uh, Judaism took uh, God Kanun fashioning man out of clay and mm -hmm. called him Jehovah. But notice the God Kanun fashioning man on the potter's wheel mm -hmm. out of clay. This is where Judaism took a portion of this to make up their Genesis story with the Sanhedrins around 250 B.C from this relief right here of God fashioning man and woman on the potter's wheel. And they took other concepts of Atom from Heliopolis creation story or the city of On to make up their Adam as a man when actually it was Atom the sun. And we see European Christianity took from the goddess Isis and Horus and made up the European, again, let me express, the European version of Mary and Jesus copied directly from these re reliefs right here. Mm -hmm. So you got Greek philosophy where he took from Tahuti and called it Hermes Trismegistus. You got the, the Jehovah uh, Genesis creation story and the Bible where they uh, took from Canum fashioning man on the potter's wheel out of clay and they turned it into making man out of clay, Adam out of clay. Mm -hmm. And you also got Christianity right here showing Isis uh, uh, lactating or breastfeeding the holy child Horus who was born of immaculate conception and virgin birth. Three concepts just from this one relief. Wow, you see? All okay. carved in stone. As you can see the line, one dark, one light, showing where this temple was under the water. Mm -hmm. Nobody could come back and read this. And that's why over here, if you look against this wall right here, much of it, they tried to chisel it all out. But our ancestors wrote endlessly as though one day we would forget our story. One day we would not know who we are. One day that the only thing that we would we, put on our genetic memory bank would be an alien, a conqueror's story. In our mind, our story would not be told. And that's why Justinian in the 6th century AD came in and closed these temples down because they were copying Christianity, the theological concepts from African people. And we'll get more into that during the lecture when we uh, uh, have the lecture series this afternoon. I want to even go further to show you sisters that y'all sacred. You are goddesses. And that's, that's the problem with the brother today. Because they took that concept out of his consciousness. That's why the, the rap groups around there calling her the bees and stuff. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Okay, now look. Ice is holding the ark of life. We know what the ark of life now is a symbol of her uterus, right? So here, again, I show you showing where the holy child is coming from her womb. Oh, See the loop? That's why she's holding it, because she wants the first immaculate conception of the first holy birth. 
is going to come from her. So she's holding the ark for life. Can you see it? Not too much yeah. glare there, right? Yeah. No, that's, that's, yeah. why, yeah. that's why the Europeans, when Justinian and the boys Theodosius, they came in, they tried to chisel it out. Mm. Couldn't deal with the real Immaculate Conception, but they weren't talking about one Immaculate Conception. Our ancestors were telling us on these release that every woman could produce an Immaculate Conception, provided that she was on the spiritual level and the man was on the spiritual level. The both of them coming together produced Immaculate Virgin Birth, which means a clean birth. But notice they chiseled out the onk, the top part of it, because that represents the womb. But the other part, they kept there to represent the crucifix. You see? That symbol that they didn't take or didn't chisel out was a symbol of the cross. They didn't chisel that one out. So this is another picture of Constantine, Constantine's vision of the cross, which he is pointing to this symbol, Sec Vincius. And this symbol we shall conquer. Through this symbol we shall conquer. Supposedly Constantine got the cross out on the battlefield. Another picture, but now that we know that Constantine came here, now we know where in fact Constantine got the cross from. Huh? Mm -hmm. Right off of your ancestor uh, uh, temples. Has nothing to do with, uh, this is blowing here, has nothing to do with no uh, crucifixion or human sacrifice. Europeans corrupted it. Now, we have no understanding or meaning of what the cross means today. And chisel out the ankh, which is a symbol for life. Now, look at this. You can see where the Western world, church, got its design. Long before you had this, the Pattaya Soka Shrine was already there. For those of you who are just coming in, this is the earliest architectural structure that they call Roman arches. No such thing as Roman arches. These are African arches. If you were to take Western uh, architecture, they say this is Roman arches, but you see this is known thousands of years ago, and this is called Patasoka Shrine. And here we see the earliest Immaculate Conception. Immaculate means clean. That means she has known no other man. No other man has entered her body. She will have a clean conception. It's the Europeans who corrupted the story, and now we are uh, looked at as a European Madonna and child where the concept was copied from here. Keep in mind, that the only person who mentions the Immaculate Conception is Luke. Mark doesn't mention it, and then also Matthews doesn't mention it, and John doesn't mention it. Luke mentions it only in terms of being clean. That literally means only one man has entered her, her body, and that is the seed of Asar. That means clean conception. That's what Immaculate means until later on at the Conference of Ephesus where our goddess Arset was diaphaganized where they brought on this whole immaculate conception of the European image of the Madonna and child that was copied from here. Come in and see the immaculate conception. This is called the Pattaya Soka Shrine, by the way. Pattaya Soka Shrine. Many of the reliefs have been chiseled out. Fortunately, this one is here telling of the first virgin birth resurrection story. With the goddess Aset forms herself into a bird and descends on top of Asar's penis. Although you see the uh, chiseling out of this penis because many of the Europeans who were coming in during their Roman times could not deal with the sacredness of the body like Theodosius and Justinian and others. But Isis is going to take the seed from his body to impregnate herself. And this is the earliest concept of the Immaculate Conception, long before uh, an angel of the Lord and Gabriel come into Mary and said she's going to be with the Holy Child. Look how Asar is lying out on the bed. Look how the Romans copied the concept. Let's go to Rome. See the Pope lying out on the same bed, same hedge crown that Asar is wearing as well, same funeral beds, even got the lion heads that you see right here, even down to the detail of the lion heads of the funeral bed. Now, the only difference is, instead of a bird perpendicular to the Pope, they have the white Mary and Jesus, the European Mary and Jesus. But here, let's take and put a set right above here, and you've got the same story, the prototype of the Madonna and Child, where she was known as the Theotokos, or the, or the Mother of God. Then she, in turn, becomes impregnated, and she's in the form of, in this form, as the Mhetid Ra, or the sacred baboon, because the baboon representing birth. You see her stomach swelled up, but she also forms the zoop type, okay, of the hippo. Why the hippo for the zoop type? Because the hippo comes out of the water. It bursts out of the water, okay? And a woman looks something like a hippo. No insult, 
but they saw that that symbolically shows that she's impregnated and how the hippo comes out of the water is symbolically like breaking her water. So the zoot type that they use was the hippo. So a set is now impregnated with the holy seed of a sar that she had taken from him when she formed herself into the bird, as you see the falcon. You know it's a set because that's her glyph for a set. She is now impregnated with the holy child. Here we see it, the earliest holy child concept of a virgin birth story. Here's the prototype of it all. This was the origin where people would come in. These temples were covered in sand. After they took everything they wanted, then all it was covered up. Time took them over. Now we're dug out to come back to see where the story came from. The earliest immaculate conception and resurrection story. Unfortunately, you can't see her on the donkey because that is too obvious right here. What is the Parakh? The Parakh is the house of life. And that would be equivalent to the present day hospital. And again, we're saying that the temples talk to us and we bring the temples to life in terms of seeing the Grand Master himself sitting on the square M Hotel. Unfortunately, you cannot see his head because his head has been knocked off. And maybe that is because uh, so the world cannot see that uh, Imhotep, this black man, was in fact the first uh, physician. Long before some Hippocrates, and still our children are told that Hippocrates was in fact the uh, first physician, but yet 2,000 years before Hippocrates, Imhotep was the first physician that he had his bowl to wash his hands. And look at the instruments here like scissors and needles and so forth. The same instruments that they use today, if you were to go into the hospital uh, for surgery, you see the medical instruments right here of Imhotep. Okay. Uh, again, we, uh, we call on our spirit, uh, spirit of our sisters who are, uh, got the Imhotep spirit. That means that they studied uh, medicine according to that of Imhotep. I think when you took medicine, did you have to take the Hippocratic Oath? Yes. Yeah. Okay. With the Hippoc now, uh, although you took the Hippocratic Oath, sisters, but that Hippocratic Oath was actually the oath dedicated to Imhotep. Mm -hmm. And although they told us that Hipp Hippocrates was a father of medicine, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, 2,000 years before Hippocrates was the uh, father, father of medicine or physician, Imhotep predated him by 2,000 years. Now, unfortunately, you see Imhotep right here, and his head is now knocked off. Mm -hmm. So the world cannot witness this African of the third dynastic period, architect, grand vizier, physician, uh, long before the pocket tees, right. But look right here. You see scissors, okay? You see suctions, you see needles. You see all the various, now are these the same instruments you tell me? Are you familiar with these instruments here? Yes. Okay, uh, are these instruments that they use today? Yes. Okay, so you see that these instruments were known by African people thousands of years before the uh, Europeans were studying medicine. Is, this is a prescription. Don't you give prescriptions? Yeah. Well, here's the prescription that Inhotep had to give. All right. All right. Right. So let's look. Balance the medicine. Yeah, yeah balance the, the medicine for the little scale. Uh huh. Also, this symbol right here, the eye of Haru. But let's look at that eye, and you can see the RX and the medical oh. and medical association is right here on the temple. All right? Nothing new under the sun. As it even further, they say it right here that uh, the origin of the RX abbreviation, <coughs> the doctors use all over the world and in all languages originated from the eye symbol of Haru. Again, the eye symbol of Haru, the right eye of Haru, that was the all-seeing eye. There is where you get your medical symbol of the RX from. Nothing new under the sun, brothers and sisters. So long before uh, the Greeks, uh, Thales, uh, long before Hippocrates, Imhotep already knew about surgery, all these things. But yet when we open up the books in the classroom, not one word is mentioned of this grandmaster genius of his time who knew about surgery long before some Hippocrates was even in existence. As we mentioned to you, this is the Pyramid of Teti. And although you see it in the uh, dilapidated state at this particular period, at this particular period, they did not make the solid stone pyramid that you saw in the Giza Plateau at this particular time. And this is the first spiritual, as they call today, religious text. This is the prototype of it all. That's what we're going to witness down here on the ancient. At this particular period of the fifth and sixth dynasty, these are the only.
pyramids that actually have writing on the walls. So you are down into Teddy's pyramid of the sixth dynastic period. As I said before, the difference of the old kingdom pyramids that you saw at the Giza Plateau, that you're equally going to see in Dajor, is that those pyramids have no meduneta, no writing. But during the fifth and the sixth dynasty, we see the writing, what is known as the pyramid text. This is where the pyramid text came from. This is the prototype of the earliest religious writing. Without this, Kemet would not have Per M. Haru coming forth by day and by night. You would not have a Torah. You would not have a Bible, and you would not have a Quran. Mm. This is the origin of the earliest spiritual writing. We're talking about this pyramid is actually a book in stone. Now, we see Ursa Ma'at Ra, Septepan Ra, Ramesu Ramariyama, a little practice you can say it too. Here we see that was his throne name, as they call Ramsi from Ramesu, is now under the ram, symbolizes Amun. 2,000 years ago, our ancestors worshipped Amun, and his symbol was the ram because the sun was in the constellation of Aries. I show this because let's go to Christian art, and you see the ram in the European Roman Christian art. Why is that ram in their Christian art? Because they were deifying and worshiping Amun. Is this animal worship here? If they have the animal ram represented as Amun in their art, and it's not animal worship, why they come into Kemet and say animal worship and pagan and heathen and polytheism and all these other type of negative terms? <laughs> Let's look at this. When you also go and look at and see the ram or the lamb over, as you see a Roman character of a Jesus here, it looks like. But when you look at that figure with the ram or the lamb over the shoulders, as it was taken from Kemet when I showed you, when the ram or the lamb in ancient Kemet, where the king became one with Amun, and the Zook type was the ram. But let's go over 4,000 years ago to the tomb of Meruka. I'm going to show you here, as you see the, the priest with the lamb, ram around his neck. But when we look at Leonardo da Vinci's uh, artwork, you see Leonardo da Vinci's artwork with the lamb or ram around his neck. You can see where the origin of that came from. But this is carved in Meruka's tomb over 4,000 years ago, long before Leonardo da Vinci's European image of the Jesus. What you see right there is the pyramid, is the boat of Khufu. That is his solar boat. This boat is 140 feet long, longer than Captain Cook's boat. When this boat was excavated in 1954 in a pit, over 1,200 pieces, the boat was dismantled. And they reconstructed, took 1,200 pieces to reconstruct this boat of Khufu. Now, what was the purpose of this boat? This boat was called the Nuonk. What is the Nuonk? What was the Nuonk? The flooding of the Nile was called the Nuonk. Now, when the Nile flooded, it was Khufu who realized that he could take his solar astral journey through the Nile to the celestial Nile that was the Milky Way to take him back to his father, Asar. So the Milky Way was looked at as the celestial Nile like the earthly now. So it was the new Ankh that took him back. That was the purpose of his boat. That later it was corrupted into Noah's Ark. Oh. Noah's Ark was taken from the new Ankh. This is where it came from. Nowhere are you going to find no Noah's Ark. If you were back at the time of 4,000 years ago or during the time of Khufu and you asked him about Noah, boy, what's wrong with you? I know nothing about no Noah. You see my boat here? This is where the story came from. The flood, the great flood. There were many floods. There was the flood of Zozer. It was Zozer during the time when he commissioned to Kanun and to Upper Kemet to let the flood waters of the New Ark come back to flood the land because 
here you see the drought took place and he and Kanum said you have not given recognition to your homeland mm -hmm. the south upper Egypt and then we see Kanum let the flood waters open up this is where we get the story this information is not given to no one here but you because you got a whole different reason for being back here and that is to tell the truth we want the truth and nothing but the truth that's what we want here you see it's a new day something is opening up here it's a spiritual consciousness so you are looking at the nuance where the Noah's Ark came from the nuance that's the origin now they got it encased in this casing here that boat was a spiritual symbolic boat to symbolically to take Khufu back to the celestial now what was the purpose of the celestial now the celestial now symbolically took him back to his spiritual father and first father that was Asar so here you see the inundation of the now connected with the Milky Way this was called the Nuonk the flooding of the now was called the Nuonk and that was the purpose of Khufu's boat was symbolically and spiritually was to take him back to his spiritual father and that was during the inundation so when the Nuonk took place that uh, spiritually told us that we would connect to the Milky Way that Nuonk was corrupted to Noah's Ark you, we got the boats brothers and sisters here's the boat right here if you went back to over 4,000 years ago in the fourth dynastic period and asked Khufu about Noah boy what's wrong with you I don't know nothing about Noah here's my boat right here here's all the animals of the world doing the number one number two and everything they just tell us any kind of stories that's why they can only give you a picture of the story but yet this flood was supposed to have taken place because we are told that God in the Bible said that he was tired that because in Genesis chapter 1 through 6 the sons of God married the daughters of men is that right this is where we were at fault in Kemet because we married foreign women on our African throne. Although we would never marry none of our own to the foreigners because they were goddesses. Here during the fifth dynasty, this African king is called Sahara. Now they were, here's the first time that we get a concept called Sa-Ra. Sa-Ra means the son of God. They were the sons of God in Kemet marrying the daughters of men onto the throne of Kemet. This is where you get the concept in Genesis chapter 1 where the sons of God married the daughters of men was taken from ancient Kemet. Brothers and sisters, here we have holy texts, holy writings. We've gone into Unus's pyramid. We've gone into Teti's pyramid. Spiritual writing when the Sahu, the spiritual body, astral projected. This is long before biblical text was even in existence. So we can see that they got a lot of the concepts from Kemet. A lot of the concepts in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament came from Kemet. We know that the pyramid text is the oldest religious text on the planet. The pyramid text in Saqqara. We know the pyramid of Unis is the oldest text. We also have pyramid text in Teti and Pepi. So when you go to Kemet and you look at these texts, when you look at the pyramid text in Unis, you can find the whole resurrection, the whole story of Osiris and everything. We know in Teti, we got the whole uh, cannibal heim, everything that's in there. We can find a lot of the concepts in the Bible that they stole from that. So. There's a lot of stealing in the Bible, but not just from Kim.